Welcome to the Provisionist Perspective. My name is Drew. My name is Eric. We are the podcast that wants to convince you to be firmly persuaded of God's love and provision for everyone. And to that end, we have a very special guest with us on today. It is, uh, some of you may know him from a broadcast. Gosh, it's been a few years now, maybe, I think, since that broadcast came out on Brother Layton's uh, podcast, Sociology 101, and it's uh, Ronnie W. Rogers. Welcome, Brother Ronnie. It's good to have you on the podcast. Thank you for allowing me to be here. It's good to be with you. So for those of our listeners that didn't get a chance to listen to the awesome interview that you did with Brother Layton on Sociology 101, which I'm sure we could get linked in the bottom after this so our viewers could go on to watch that. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your ministry and background, introduce yourself for the listeners, um, and then we'll talk okay. some more. Well, I, I grew up in uh, Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I ended up being a small business owner. I worked on the railroad and did some other things, but had no desire you know, to be, I wasn't a Christian until I was 25. And but mm -hmm. since then, I, I've been married for I think it's 47 years and have uh, well two, done. Yeah, we're doing well. I, she's very <laughs> kind. I have uh, two grown daughters and uh, great sons in law and seven grandchildren, one of them being a girl. I just have to mention that. And so uh, God really changed my life when I came to Christ at 25 years old. And my dad had just died. And so that was the occasion. And uh, mm. I had always had him in my mind. It was I wasn't an atheist. I just didn't go to church or nothing was important to me. And I didn't grow up in that kind of home. Mm. And it wasn't a reading home, a talking home or anything. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was eight. My dad was an alcoholic, uh, bankrupt and so forth and so on. And so that's not the best environment. But uh, when I came to Christ at 25, that changed everything. And my uh, wife was saved two months later. And that was a very great blessing. And so at that time, I'd lived my life with money first, family second, and God third. And so my salvation experience was uh, uh, very uh, jejun in the sense that I didn't know any of the Bible. I didn't know what to say. So you, if you were critiquing it, you'd say, well, he did everything wrong. And, uh, <laughs> But I did get saved and my life changed from that moment forward. And my wife was saved two months later. So I didn't have any of that in my background or anything like that. And then mm -hmm. I've been in ministry now since I surrendered to ministry in 1980. And then I was ordained in 1981 as Southern Baptist pastor. I pastored three churches, one of them for a year. That was the first church. And then the second one, I was there 13 years in Arkansas, Hot Springs. And I've been at this one, I think I'm in my 24th year now. Wow. That's cool. So it's, it's a long time to, to be in one space. And the yeah. name of your congregation there in um, Norman, Oklahoma, and it's Trinity Baptist Church. Cool. And our listeners can find uh, sermons and and different writings and stuff over there uh, if they just yeah. google you and, and look you up yeah they can go to trinity baptist church website norman they can go to my blog ronniewrogers.com and then all my, and you can get to my all my sermons and uh so forth from there but uh, sermonaudio.com has all of our sermons okay. and so they're very accessible and you're you're writing reg regularly on on Ronnie yes. Rogers. Yeah. yeah, on RonnieRogers.com, I write and publish an article every two weeks. And That's on right. something, I've written a lot on Calvinism. I, I, I'm writing quite a bit on what's known as cultural Marxism, CRT, things like that. I've written a book yeah. on it. But I also try to write articles trying to help uh, just the average person understand what's going on and the threat it is to Christianity and things of that nature. And then I write books. So I have my eighth book at the publisher right now. Congratulations. Mm. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, early on in our podcasting journey, Eric, you might remember this, of course, we went through kind of off base of our usual kind of soteriological 
rants and talking about, you know, salvation, all that different stuff on, we did an episode on critical race theory where, where you and I both watched a lecture from Neil Shenvey. Yeah. And it was my first exposure to a Christian response to that material. And I was at the time quite, maybe you you would say sympathetic and skeptical. I think of my raging conservative (laughs) co-host and, and I think it's, yeah, it turned out to be a a much bigger issue (laughs) than I, than I thought it was. So that was ever ever since, ever since that Drew and I started making content together. And even as we were talking about this and planning this, I was just like, red pilling him to conservatism i was just come on back i knew you grew up in the south come home back <laughs> come home yeah i've been i've been through an interesting you might say ideological journey um mm. so yeah but that that's for another episode on another yes. day but <laughs> yeah so well tell us a little bit about your theological journey brother ronnie so how did you kind of i mean I've heard a little bit of the story, but how did you arrive where you are now soteriologically, just in terms of God's plan of salvation? And all that well, stuff? well, when I when I uh, was saved at uh, uh, 25, I I really was not a, a reader or I mean, to say I was not academically inclined is really bragging uh, because I was really so inept. I never read a complete book in my life. I graduated high school with 0.9 grade average and you're supposed to have a one point, but I think they hated me so bad and it would benefit the school if they could get rid of me. And so, <laughs> point nine point, and they let you go. That's, I'm, yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm, yeah, it's impressive. And I, so I'm just, go ahead. Because I've been, I, not to interrupt you, but I've been reading your book, um, Does God Love All or Some yeah. on the Kindle. And thankfully, they have a built in dictionary app because I, I highlight stuff. I'm like, I don't know what that word means right there. Oh, okay. Like, so I'm yeah. I'm learning stuff from the guy that well, the 0.9 GPA guy wants to Yeah. Time, so. Yeah. So it kind of makes you say, well, I may not want to learn from him. But uh, when I when I got saved, of course, I didn't have a Bible and, and nothing. And but uh, after my dad's funeral, I went to the bookstore and bought uh, some books. And so I, I think I'm, I'm very, I'm conservative in this. So over these 44 years now, I, my education, I, I've spent an average of five hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year studying. So that, that's what I, I, I think would be very uh, realistic in my life. And I think all the people who know me, both family and so forth, would say, that I get up early and I do this and I've just done it. So God put that in me. I'm just saying I wasn't naturally inclined. And, and so I was just reading constantly. And then uh, I, I, after God called me to preach, I knew I needed to go to school. And so I wasn't around. The, well, I didn't have a college education. And so I decided that I need to do that. I didn't actually decide Jesus and Gina, my wife did in that order. And they pushed me. And so I went to the University of Arkansas. That's going to be the name of this episode is Jesus and Gina. Yeah. I always tell people that they're the greatest influences on my life in that order. (laughs) But but they both had me going to school and I was very mad about it because I was you could tell I was an academic. And I went to the University of uh, Arkansas in Little Rock and the academic dean, whom I had to meet with, looked at my transcript looked at me, looked at my transcript, looked at me, and he said, you have no business being on a college campus. <laughs> and my thought was, well, he's right, God. I mean, here he is. He's an expert in this, and he knows. And But I, I went ahead and went, took a reading class. They tested me. I read on a sixth grade level. And so I had a lot of ground to catch up on just to get where normal people were. And that was at 28 years old. But anyway, I was reading all the time and finally went to Criswell College. Well, Dr. Patterson was president when I was there and learned an enormous amount there. It was a very hard school. And then when I got out of that, I went to graduate school and went into counseling at a secular university. I, I, that's not what I wanted. But once I got there, about four months in, I said, so Lord, this is why I'm here, because it really is all about philosophy. And it's about a different view of humanity. And I started listening to messages of people that were preaching 
And I was hearing them say things that I had learned from atheist counselors. And so it's, it's been very helpful in that way because I do have an interest in apologetics and things like that. And But I was just reading very broadly, trying to all the time. I read a lot of apologetics and uh, theology. I read, like I bought Chafer's Systematic Theology, which is an eight volume. And so I read it three times, uh, I, you know, and that's kind of what I would say kind of framed me because I ended up being a four point Calvinist yeah, for those yeah. uh, 30 years, 33 years. And uh, but 20 of them, I, I was just undaunted. I, I was very sold on it. I never did buy the fifth point. The L, the L and two. Yeah. Mm. The L. Yeah. OK. And in, in my experience, that tends to be what the majority of the Southern Baptist Calvinists are, are four point kind of more moderate Calvinists. It, I mean, maybe I just exist in the online world, but certainly the five pointer Calvinists are much louder <laughs> in, yeah. in my experience. I don't know if that's true among, among the congregations and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Well, the four point, I mean, uh, not to get off on it, but there was, the reason we generally didn't accept the limited atonement was because we believe the Bible taught that he died for everyone. And what that made you feel like is that you could freely tell people that God loved them and wanted them to be saved. Now, I don't believe that anymore because we still believed in unconditional election. And if you believe in unconditional election, you cannot tell anybody that God wants them saved. You can't do it and be consistent. So I did it all the time. And I thought that not believing in limited atonement, and we actually argued that. But now I mm -hmm. argue that, no, if you believe in unconditional election, then you cannot look at somebody and say, God loves you and wants you saved. So Ronnie, you mentioned that you were a, a Calvinist for 20 years staunchly, and then 33 years total, what was, yep. what started you on the path of questioning the other four points and for 13 years? And then what was that like for you? Well, I'm, I'm a little slow, but I've always got a lot of things I'm studying at different times. And so, you know, I, I, I have all these documents and, and used to be folders that we filed stuff in. And so I would run into things I wanted to think through more deeply. And I would just throw them in a folder, throw them in a folder. And now we do that electronically. And so that's the way it was with Calvinism. I, I would answer. I knew all the answers. I've, I've argued those things and so forth and written about them, spoke about them for years. And that was 20 years. But when I came here, I had a little bit of time that I could go back and do greater research on some questions that I had. And I thought I would find my answers in Calvinism. And because I wasn't ready to leave at all, I wasn't doubting it. I was just thinking, you know, I want consistency. So that's the 13 years that I, I was going back and I was looking at different issues. And, and, and then that caused greater doubt. I, I began to think that we're not answering what, that we're not answering the questions people are asking. We're answering and they think we've answered their question, but we haven't. And then we're using, and so things happened to me during this time, and I just kept taking notes. And when I wrote the book, Reflections of a Disenchanted Calvinist, which was in 2012, the, that, the title of that book was actually going to be Reflections of a Minor Calvinist. In other words, I wasn't leaving Calvinism. And I wrote that book. It has a kind of a, a peculiar li literary aspect to it, but if you look at it from the standpoint of a pastor answering questions to the flock, that's mm -hmm. what it's for. So somebody says, what do you believe about predestination? Well, I could give them that. It's affirmation, disaffirmations. Where did babies go? And so it wasn't ever, I never thought it would go out beyond the church, but it was going to be of a minor Calvinist. So I, I, I say Calvinist, major Calvinist are four and five point, and then minor Calvinists are three, two, and one. And so as I kept thinking through and writing always helps you to really deal with different issues. Sure. I noticed going through the book that I was moving from a three, from a four to a three and a half to a three to a two and three quarters to a two and a half. And it was a long process over these years. And 
when I got close to the ending the book, I remember I had a day which was very solemn because see my whole Christian life, I'd been a Calvinist mm. and, and I didn't know what I was, but I mm. said, Lord, I said, I know I'm not a Calvinist. I don't mm. know what I am. I don't know where I go. It was incredibly lonely actually. And, mm. and I remember just a couple of days, just kind of wandering around. Uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And, but I completely, so during that, I, I came to the conclusion, which I've written around, written about, and does God love all or some, that one, two, three point are not Calvinism. They're folk Calvinism, but they're hmm. not Calvinism. And, and true Calvinists will tell you that, but, you know, sometimes you want the numbers just because you have more <laughs> Calvinists, but, right. they're, but they're not Calvinist at all. And they just like the term, they like people and so forth. And so finally, the book became titled A Disenchanted. And I admitted to other people that I had walked away. Now, I didn't, I still had a lot of questions to answer because I'd always given the Calvinist answer. And so now I felt that I had an obligation to God to answer those questions, not just say, well, that's wrong. Right. That's what. I tried to do in my articles, and then that's what does God love all or some that tried to lay out my answering of these challenges to free will and questions and things of that nature. But I, I began to read things really simple. So I know this sounds, you know, extremely simple, but when you're in Calvinism, so for example, if I, and, and I don't mean these things pejoratively, but if I say, that a Calvinist cannot entertain God creating a world where man has free will. They, they, I, I haven't found them to be able to do that. So I can entertain that God could have, he's capable of choosing to create a world with compatible moral freedom and everything's determined. I have no problem with that. He can do hmm. that. I also know he can create one where man has some free will, but they can't do that because they can't entertain it. So you can't have discussions. And so what I, what kind of brought me out of it was you were reading verses uh, like John six forty four. you know, all that the father uh, draws, he'll come and everything. And so I, this is the way I approach it. I just ask a real simple question. So I, so I did the interpretive thing. I started asking, so what does it say and what does it not say? And that's observation. And right. I started, started realizing was that much of what we were saying was there, wasn't there. It is through the lens of Calvinism, but it really isn't there. So that would lead me to not knowing what was right. I didn't know who had the right answer. I just knew that it wasn't saying what we said. And then, so it, that's supposed to be a slam dunk verse. And so one of the questions I remember asking was, okay, so this is supposed to be knitted together. This is Calvinism. God draws you, you come. That's the end of the question. That's right. All right. So I looked at that verse and I said, okay, is there anything that is essential to salvation that's not in that verse? And it would have to be something that everyone would agree on. In other words, it couldn't be the non-Calvinist or the Calvinist. It would have to be that everyone would say, yes, that is an essential thing and it is not there. And that's Christ dying on the cross. He had to die on the cross and it's right. not there. So if there's one thing not there that's essential, then there can be other things. And that's where I moved into God comprehending faith and things like that. I can do the same thing with election and, and it helps a lot of people when they start thinking in simple terms because we're up here so much uh, and, and some of this stuff. But when you get down to simple terms like that and you're just observing and you're saying, okay, you may be right or you may be right, but one thing's for sure, this verse doesn't tell us everything. So you were trying to get at like the kind of underlying presuppositions or philosophies behind yeah. and and point out that they may be right, but they're they're presuppositions, they're they're brought in. They're yeah, not they're important. They're important. Yeah, they have right. importations, and the importations are so subtle, you get so used to doing them that you think they're there, but they're really not there. And, and even in their definitions, their definitions are very narrow. 
And so if you accept their definition, the sovereignty means control. Right. Uh, if you accept mm -hmm. that, the only way to go is to be a Calvinist. That's right. We, so you have to back away and ask the question, does sovereignty mean that? And then once you realize it's more of a jurisdictional word, meaning that God is over everything. It doesn't tell me how he manages that, but it does tell me nothing is out of his jurisdictional purview. And so then you have to mm -hmm. work through that. And if I can, mm -hmm. I don't I, I just take the word elect. This is a really good one. It's real simple. So elect, when you hear the word elect, it's a little scary because it seems to, he, he's snatching you up and right. that's it. So what I did with that word, now you got to understand that's why it takes me 13 years to get through this stuff. But because <laughs> I, I did this with each word, I did it with all of our verses that we use, et cetera. And sometimes it doesn't lead you to the answer. It just leads you to this isn't as sure as you think it is. But the word elect means select, choose, things like that. That's right. So when you think just about that, and we're talking about just grammatically, we're not talking about theologically. It means to choose, okay? But what it doesn't do is tell me what is comprehended in the choice. Right. So, so for example, we elect presidents in America. We elect leaders. And they elect leaders in other countries. So let's take uh, in, in the Soviet Union when the Politburo. So we all use the word elect, but we mean something very different. You have to find out what's comprehended in the word. And so I did this with baseball teams. You know, I choose this guy, choose this guy. And then I choose this uh, young Brit to be on my team, and but he can't play ball. And so after it's over, the other coach asked me, said, so why, why'd you choose him? I mean, he, he can't play ball. And I said, because I really like the British people. And I, and I really do. You know, I go there, uh, uh, been there several times and see, you wouldn't have known what was comprehended in my choice. So I think election is the selecting and the New Testament and Old Testament is telling us what God has comprehended in that. And I think that's how you bring the reconciliation of election and whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I had to figure out how to work all that together, but that's what I would say. So I did that over and over with each word and verse. And hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we we have a saying here that I think I think we said pretty early on in the podcast that elect just means to choose things and God chooses things <laughs> and people. Yeah. And the question is when, how, why, you know, and yeah. so on. So you can you can it's ask a lot of different questions there. And apparently yeah. there are some things comprehended or he would just say, I choose you. And then we wouldn't have the rest of the new Testament. Or Old Testament. <laughs> right. <laughs> he spends, he spends a lot of time explaining why, right. you know, he's well, chosen Israel and that yeah. stuff. So, so that, that must've left you a little bit um, shipwrecked in terms of, or maybe stranded floating on a lifeboat theologically. And you didn't really have any, any answers. You just, had kind of realized what part of your former sociological position that you thought was all biblical, you had sort of cut it back a little bit and seen how much of it was philosophical. And, and then all of that was still up in the air. And, and you, you said the word alone. So yeah, I, I can see how that would make you feel pretty alone. Yeah, it's, very, it's a very lonely feeling. And and there, so that's what people, because I deal with people coming out of Calvinism. And what some people don't realize is there's a psychological aspect. And there's an identity mean, to it. Yeah. I don't mean that in a bad way, but my the, my heroes, uh, my life was in there. And so this one guy, he told me, he said, he said, if I leave, then I'm turning my back on all these people. And I said, no, you're not. I said, I still love these guys and I can learn from them. I think they're wrong on this. So, but it did take me the first time I wrote something against John MacArthur, who has, who has been one of the mentors. He doesn't know me, but he's been one uh, for many years. Uh, I, I paused for a day before I would go ahead and let it be in the book and put it out because I still yeah, respect yeah. them so much for so many reasons. And so I try to be respectful. I love these guys. I just disagree. 
and I don't disagree in a minor way. I'm you. You said something earlier that I'm really interested in and and, and curious to pick at. You said that in when you were a Calvinist pastor and people were asking you questions and then you were looking up answers, you would see that you and others were trying to answer these questions or seeking to answer these questions, but there was this niggling sense of actually that's not really a valid answer. What's, can you think of an example that kind of come to you might've said, well, here's the, here's the answer to that. And then kind of thought, oh, well, actually that doesn't make sense. I need to look into that later or, or something like that. Uh, no, I, I did think it made sense. Uh, I think Calvinism, they, they've written voluminously and there are different reasons that people give why they write so much. But the fact is they've written more than anybody else. So I, I felt like I was giving answers. And most people, when we answer them as a Calvinist, they go, oh, well, that helps. But they don't realize they don't realize there are entailments. And so a lot of my books deal with the entailments of these ideas. And you can't, you cannot say that God has chosen these people unconditionally and therefore he did not choose these. So they cannot be saved. And then this next breath, God loves the world and wants them to be saved. And so these entailments are what I kept having problems with. So I felt like I was giving the right answers. You know, somebody would say, um, so do you believe that anybody can be saved? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Absolutely. And they'd go, oh, okay. Well, I was told that y'all didn't believe that. And I'd say, no, we believe it. But see, I didn't answer the question because the real question was, do you believe any individual or every person can be saved? That's what they're wondering. And we're answering it with our little statements. So I felt like when I was, went into the, uh, the years of research and looking back, I had every intention of just bolstering my Calvinism. So it wasn't, right. it wasn't on a track and see, uh, uh, I may be getting ahead, but I, I didn't really read books that were directly against Calvinism. I probably did towards the end, but it was the Calvinists themselves. It was Calvinism itself that turned me against Calvinism because I started finding mystery, like the term mystery, I mean, it's common as it could be. And what I started noticing was, okay, is this a mystery if I were not a Calvinist? And my answer would be no. So I found them to be Calvinistically generated mysteries. And if you got rid of the Calvinism, you didn't have them. And then you find what I call double talk. And again, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I found that they would say things and I would say them that this verse says it's the verse says it. There's no doubt about it, but it was inconsistent with Calvinism. And so that was those inconsistencies and those entailments that I kept driving. And eventually, I don't know if you've ever heard of Thomas Kuhn, but he's a scientist and he wrote a book called The Structure of a scientific revolution. And the brief thing about it is it's very, you know, uh, it, it's a really good book, been around a while. But but the bottom line is a scientist is sitting in his place doing his study under this certain theory, whether it's Ptolemaic, you know, or Newtonian or uh, Einsteinian or so forth or quantum and whatever it is. But you're, you're doing it and you and you're answering questions, but you are coming up with anomalies. Your, your theory doesn't answer these questions. So the stack of anomalies keeps getting higher. And eventually there's a scientific revolution and a new theory comes in. And the same scientist sitting in the same room is now looking at the facts and data and coming to different conclusions. But eventually that theory begins to build up some anomalies it doesn't answer. So that's kind of what happened to me there became so many of them that to stay in it, I just couldn't do it. Mm. And you do, I must say, I think I've gotten around three quarters of the way through the book. Does God love all or some I've jumped back and forth between the chapters because they're very topical and you can kind of yes. go back and forth, but you do a really good job of, you know, steel manning 
the Calvinist position because you were one for 20 to 33 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then saying here, are, here are the inescapable entailments. Here's, here's what yeah. follows on from that. And I yeah. think it's one, one thing that's, that struck out to me that I think is, I mean, we don't have to follow this rabbit trail, but that I think is interesting and worth discussion. And, and I'm surprised that it maybe doesn't get more discussion is that God could have compatibilistically freely determined that everyone, or at least more, many, many more people would come to faith freely. And That's yet right. he, he hasn't. And then why is that? And yeah. usually the response is, well, because God has his vessels that he wants yeah. to display his wrath on to, mm-hmm. to, to, to kind of paraphrase someone who shall not be named to <laughs> sh- show the, the full spectrum of his right. attributes, you know, yeah. it's wrath, justice, and love and mercy. And, and I think that's, that that was really interesting. I, I thought that that stuck out to me in terms of where you were talking about the entailments specifically of yeah. determinism of, of compatibilistic determinism. So, yeah, that, that that particular thing. That's what they say is they say, well, you know, uh, this shows his grace that he elected these and that he didn't. These others there have to be people that go to hell to show his wrath and the seriousness of sin. And I written on that and and one of the books and then also some articles. And my position on that is that that wasn't necessary at all because he could have sent fewer people to hell compatibilistically. See, he's determining who's going to hell. So he could have sent fewer and we'd still known about his wrath, but actually no one had to go to hell. If he saved every person and Christ died for their sin, that would show us the full wrath of God and the horror of sin. That's right. right. That was the point. Now that you mentioned it, I remember that was the point that stuck out to me and I went, Hmm. <laughs> that's a yeah. really valid yeah. point that I don't think I've heard before, but yeah. yeah. What was, so as you were struggling with this and you would kind of, your, your journey was to write in yourself notes and kind of mm-hmm. stick it in a folder and come back to it later mm-hmm. and everything like that. What was the, the verse uh, or the issue that you kept having to pull out of that folder and revisit uh, the most or for the longest before you f- felt like you nailed down uh, the answer? Well, I mean, I, I wasn't at first, I wasn't trying to answer everything. I was trying to observe and see if the answers of Calvinism were really innate in, you know, the passage or something of that nature. Mm. And and like I said, were the mysteries true mysteries? Because I think there are mysteries in the scripture. Sure. But are they true mysteries? Or if I wasn't a Calvinist, would there be a mystery there? And there wasn't. And and then uh, one of the things that was very difficult and concealing, so I used to use the word a milder Calvinist, you know, or moderate Calvinist, and right. I can still use that a little bit, but I it, it means different than the way we use it. Well, he's he's not hard line, but but here's the deal: if you believe in unconditional election, you're hard line. But what what happens is, and I and I do this in the books and my articles. Uh, and I show, so a Calvinist will read a verse and they will maybe comment on it just like it is. And John MacArthur is very good at doing this. And he he expounds the verse and talks about it. And so he talks about, you know, uh, in Acts, uh, uh, in the book of Acts, where it talks about they gave the gospel and it, it was a tragedy. They didn't believe and all they had to do was repent and MacArthur says God gave everything for them to be able to do that. But none of that is consistent with Calvinism. <laughs> so that's what I call double talk, that you're you're a Calvinist holding to these things. You denounce anybody who believes in libertarian free will. And even if you get involved in this, you find that they don't even believe that God can be sovereign over a libertarian uh, free world. And, and he surely can't know what's going on. So that's a diminished view of God. But but they, but they look at these verses and they, there's like John three sixteen. I mean, I would just say all the time, you know, God loves the world and you can be saved and on and on and on, <laughs> but that's inconsistency. So it's this double talk. And that's what makes people think, well, he's a gentler Calvinist, but actually he's a less consistent Calvinist. 
because so it just took so it took you longer to kind of answer the questions and of of the more um, cognitive dissonance or mm. inconsistencies of what do I exactly do with these these two things? Yeah, uh, that took you a little bit longer to flesh out. On yeah, it was a process. It, it was, and and you know, I was taking one of these at a time. And this this tool of observation, you know, uh, exegesis is the formal term, but the but 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 I had learned long ago the the process of observation of a scripture, and that's where yeah. you don't use any other scriptures. You're not trying to figure out the meaning. You're not applying right. it. You're just saying, what does it say, and right. and what does it not say, and sometimes we rush over that, and that. That was very helpful uh, to me, like uh, like like Nicodemus, for example, you know, in the new birth. And so they use that to show that you, you have to be born again before you have faith. But when you just observe it, and it, or it goes all the way through John 3, 16. But when you just observe it, there, there's a couple of things that happen there. Number one, you never see that sequentiality is being addressed in those first few verses. It's the question of essentiality. In other words, you must. That doesn't tell you about sequence. See, that's being read into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I noticed that, and I noticed that the word was must, and must talks about essentiality. So now I know there's a certain thing that has to be. There's no way about it. But mm -hmm. as you go along, it seems to me in verse 15, where he goes back into the serpent of brass in the Old Testament, there he lays out the sequence. So when you put the whole passage together, and then when you back up to those first few verses, what actually happens in salvation is revelation comes first. You have faith in the revelation. And then salvation follows that. So Nicodemus, as we all know, would have a very hard time what do you mean I don't have what it takes? And then Nicodemus also knew if you have to be born again, that's some kind of creative matter and there's nothing I can do about that. So at some point he had to believe what Jesus said, that you don't have enough. This has to happen and you can't make it happen. So Nicodemus would have had to at some point, either I believe what you're saying or I don't believe it. So faith actually mm. even there precedes the new birth. So again, just looking at what's there, no commentary or anything, and just and I call it the simple, uh, simple approach to scripture, not simplistic, but simple. Hmm. One oh, thing God. that that I've noticed in dialoguing on that particular passage is it's very subtle. They will say, speaking of observation and just what does the text say, they'll say, you can't even see the kingdom of God. But the word even isn't there. Right. So the implication is you can't even see it much less believe unless you're born again first. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't say even. Yeah. It doesn't say that. And so I think it, in dialogues with this, I, I often notice either you can't even see or you can't even enter mm -hmm. without. And That's the even right. is not there. That's right. and, and then that word even comes loaded if you're familiar with Calvinistic mm -hmm. sociology with this kind of other stuff, you know, the yeah. presuppositions as you were saying it, as you were saying, loading into it. So, yeah, I, I think so. And even many Calvinists admit that C means enter. And then I go into that. Uh, it's interesting to me that in verse uh, 15 before verse 16, you know, John three sixteen, the great verse, it, it expands what happened with the serpent of brass which they would have all known, you know, everybody would have known that Nicodemus, but it expands it to the world. But the serpent of brass was just the Jews. And so I, I went back to the event in the old Testament and I just wrote down by observation what went on. And there are about uh, uh, 25 parallels. In other words, look and live. Even hmm. people in the back who might not could have seen if they trusted what somebody said, look, just look, doesn't matter, you know, if you can see it clear. And then if you don't, you die. And that was an act of faith, faith, God provided. So there's about 25 things there that parallel verse 16. 
And that tells you over and over and over the sequence. And God has made all the provision. Everybody could look. Everybody could live mm. or they could choose not to. And, and it's just interesting to me that if Jesus is going to give his commentary or lens to look at the most important salvific verse in the world, you know, uh, he used that event to do that. So I think when we interpret John 3.16, we need to look at it through the lens that he set rather than somebody else. I, I find it interesting that what we all often get pushback on and the claim that's often made from our um, Calvinistic interlocutors is that, you know, oh, you, you just have to study the text. Yeah. It's just what the Bible says. Or, oh, you know, you guys are doing the, the tradition thing again, or you're doing the philosophy thing. You just, you, you just have to go back to the text. But your journey out of it was only reading the Calvinistic theologians yes. Yes. and returning to the text and the text brought, brought you out of it. Like you did what they would say to do that would arrive you at Calvinism. Okay. You did that and it, and it brought you out of it. Uh, I find, I find that interesting. Yeah. They say that what you said, uh, but it doesn't ever answer our questions. It's just kind of an attack on us. Well, it does right. this, you do, you do, but, but you're exactly sure. right. And so, so what I tried to, so I was meeting with a Calvinist friend of mine. He's five point, very knowledgeable, very sharp. And so we're meeting and it's about, and I'm talking about compatibilism because I think, I think the misunderstanding of compatible moral freedom versus libertarian freedom on both sides, by the way, the misunderstanding of that is causing us enormous problem. So anyway, he's a very knowledgeable guy. And so we met for several weeks and I wanted him to tell me whether Adam and Eve could have chosen not to sin. It's a long journey to get there. And I had to keep asking this question and he would, and cause you have, they have answers. And then he gave this answer. And I said, that's not my question. Let me restate it. So I would restate it. And then we'd go along a while and he would say, I'd say, that's not my question. Let me restate it. And then we meet the next week. And finally, one day after I'd gotten through the roadblocks, because there are these roadblocks, see, and if you don't know them, they win. And, you yeah. know, you got to get in, you got to exegete. Or, okay, well, let's just go there and observe. But anyway, eventually he, he paused and sat there for a few seconds. And then he said, no. <laughs> and I said, this is what I'm going to ask you to do, my friend. When you preach that text, preach it that way. Don't preach it so that they think you believe like I do. So this is, if you <laughs> want to know what one of my passions is, is I love my Calvinist brothers and sisters and so forth, but let's be honest and clear. We have an obligation. I have an obligation for you to look, know why I'm saying what I'm saying. And they do too and not hide it. But you're right. I came out, I came out because of my knowledge of Calvinism, reading Calvin, all my theology books except one are, are Calvinist. All my commentaries are Calvin. I mean, this is all I have. This is this was my life. So it was reading them. Later, I started reading some other people thinking, and really it was after, I think, after I'd left before I really got any serious looking into that because mm -hmm. it was the text. So so to repeat, I, I, I was seeing these... Uh, entailments, inconsistencies, and I would go to the passage and I would observe. And that let me know what was there, what wasn't there. It didn't answer who was right or wrong. Then the next question was, okay, this is what we say as Calvinists. And my next question would be, is, is there a possible another understanding of this? Is there one possible? And maybe there wasn't. And so there would be. And then I would say, OK, what would make it plausible? And I would walk through that. So it was, this was the long journey. And yeah. and I and I began to say, OK, there is another option. It's not like we think as Calvinists that there isn't even an option. If you're going to do exegesis, you, you don't even have an option. I realized there was an option. And then I began to think, you know what? I think the options are better sometimes. And so so it was the scripture. And it was what Calvinists say, and I have said as well. 
Mm-hmm. I want to um, go to something you just said that I just read recently in your book that I thought was a, a really fascinating thing. And it does come through very clear in there that you want your our Calvinistic brethren to be really precise. Mm-hmm. And one of our mantras here and online has been that, and I think Brother Layton has said this, you know, countless occasions too, is that Calvinism plainly stated for everyone to hear, people would just go, no, nah, no, thank you. Oh, but, yeah. and to that end, one thing that you said in your book was take a Calvinist brother or sister with you out to share faith mm-hmm. and then let them share faith and listen to them. And then, you know, the other person's listening to and then ask the person, the unbeliever that you're speaking well, with, what did you understand as being communicated there that mm-hmm. he said, you know, and they say, oh, well, I get I get the sense that you're saying that, you know, Christ died for me for the sins mm-hmm. of the world and that if I trust in him, that he will give me everlasting life and that he loves me and wants me to be saved. You know, they might say something like that. And then, you know, I guess you're having this conversation afterwards. And so that's not, so what you communicated to her, she didn't understand. That's not the truth, right? right. She didn't that's understand right. that correctly. That's right. And I, and you've made a similar point that I, I like so much that we clipped it and put it on Twitter. I think at one stage, I don't know if we put it, I think we might've put it in a broadcast mm-hmm. where you, you talk about horizontal love, genuine yes. horizontal love yeah. for mankind, or is it just out of obligation yeah. to God yeah. that, that we share the gospel? And I thought those were two really salient points and really fascinating. In fact, I talked to a brother here uh, several, uh, it's been months ago or so, and we just f- first started talking about our own respective views. And I asked him, we both know this, a particular unbelieving person. We're both in ministry here with university students. And I asked him, I said, so would you tell X that Christ loves her and died for her? And he said, yeah, yeah, I would. You know, I was like, but that, that's not compatible with what, well, he, you know, in a sense he's died and he's reconciling the world to himself. And I was just thinking, but we have to be frank here, you know, It was really interesting. I, I thought those were those are really good points. And yeah. Yeah. And what you ran into is very common. And that's what we we have to have uh, clarity. And see, I think we, we mess up sometimes on the non-Calvinist side. We we make statements. Uh, so, for example, we say that the Calvinist doesn't make a choice in salvation. Well, that's too broad of a statement. And you have to get into the sequence of events. They don't make a choice in regeneration, but after that, they become it becomes more uh, synthesized. And then on this, we say the you know how can they be evangelistic? And that's where I'm dealing with that. They they can be vertically, out of obedience to God. They literally right. can do that, but horizontally, they cannot look at a person. And I've run into this several times talking to them, and that. They can't look at that person and and love that person and want that person saved beyond a shadow of a doubt from a Calvinistic standpoint, because it, it doesn't matter whether you know whether they're elect or not. What if they're not elect and you want them saved? Where did that come from? Right. Well, either your psychology or either the devil but God didn't give it to you because he didn't want them that. So it really causes a dilemma. And I've witnessed a lot to cults and various things. And, you know, even when I was a Calvinist, I wanted them saved and stuff. I just didn't know I was violating all these entailments. And I, mm-hmm. and I was violating mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. I've ca- I've come to call it, you know, I've come to call it the Holy Spirit tells the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right. you know, we believe our brothers and sisters are born again. They're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And they have yeah. this genuine heartfelt motivation from the Holy Spirit that everyone yeah. should be saved. And thankfully that comes through <laughs> yeah. in many, if not most yeah. evangelistic uh, endeavors that a that a yeah. Calvinist yeah. or anyone else for that matter would. But they're just and, 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 and Drew, I've seen you really endeavor to get somebody to answer that question for you. 
where did that d desire come mm -hmm. from? Uh, mm -hmm. Ronnie Drew has taken that question to the streets and I've watched him try to oh, get yes. people to answer that yeah. question. And they just, I haven't seen them answer it. I, they, they, they can't, yeah. uh, they, they can't answer it. And it, it is, it is a, a great question because of how, how much it makes them squirm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, all of a sudden they've learned gymnastics yeah. and, and they're just, they just start doing a floor routine mm -hmm. when, when you, or they ninja, they hit a smoke bomb and ninja and they're gone because yeah. yeah. it's online yeah. and you can, that's my favorite. That's my, yeah. the ninja vanish, yeah. ninja <laughs> vanish. And you can online, you can ninja vanish. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you're, when you're sitting across the coffee table, um, and you're asking those questions about Adam and Eve, uh, you know, they can't ninja vanish. And so yeah. that's gotta be a, a great place to have these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th the other thing I would wonder is th this is sort of apart from your journey. Now that you're on the other side of this and you've been on the other side of this for quite some time, what resources, if, if, if you were to talk to a kind of normie provisionist Christian who mm. wants to get into these things, what resource would you recommend that can give them, I don't know, maybe more confidence or more tools as how to deal with um, or, or or express their own soteriology and, and yeah. deal with those things that they see out there? Yeah. And we're just talking about the average person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I've not done great with that uh, because I was trying to tack this at a different level. Hmm. But uh, I have a, the book at the publisher right now is designed for that, for that oh, group. Great. And uh, but I mean, we we have uh, I, I send everybody to like your podcast, Layton's podcast, and then I recommend books. But the books, uh, we do not have as many as the Galvins. I mean, they're no. just outwritten. Us. There's no yeah. way around that. And. And, and sometimes the books we have, they're very good. Like David Allen, I mean, he, he's really one of the most knowledgeable people uh, in this sphere. And, you know, he wrote the tomb that is the response to the Calvinist. Uh, and But I remember talking to him one time, and this was a few years ago when I was at the seminary uh, for one day, and we were talking about, different things and he said well so far i've read every book as i recall in print on both sides on the calvinism issue so he's very knowledgeable but i i recommend him and then he has a shorter book than the atonement the atonement you know whatever seven or eight hundred pages so his shorter one's about three three hundred you know it's just a hop skip and a jump oh just three <laughs> yeah and I, uh, but i do I, recommend that and then uh, Adam Harwood, I don't know if you've ever heard him, but he's sure. written some good articles. Now he's writing, a, he has a systematic theology that will be out pretty quick. Same. Yeah. And it's going to be uh, not a Calvinistic one. And, and we need that desperately. We want to get need, him on here ASAP to talk about he, that. Uh, he's book. very, That's... yes. I mean, it's incredible. And he is very gracious, very knowledgeable. And, and we need those books because we send people to seminary and they have to use a Calvinist one. And then the professor, if he's not a Calvinist, he has to say, well, I don't agree with all this, but you're still studying them. And so, so anyway, uh, he, he does a good job. I'll tell you, there's a, there's a uh, uh, John Lennox, Lennox, and he was a professor at Oxford. Yeah. And he wrote a book called Determined to Believe. And so it's a little bit difficult uh, like all of these are. And that's what I think when you write the simpler ones, uh, what happens, and I have a guy in our church who's written some really simple pamphlets uh, or little booklets for college students. But what I found is when you, and they're good, they serve a purpose, but then the Calvinist comes along and says, well, we don't really believe it that way. And, and so it kind of debunks it. And what I've tried to do is get them to think about the two perspectives on free will choice and ask them which one they think is reflective of what they read in the scripture. Do these people really make choices 
and consequences with those choices? Or has God determined them to act a certain way? And that's all kind of just theater. And you can ask the average person this and they'll go, well, no, it, I mean, it, he gives them a choice and he tells them what, if you do this, I'll do this. And that's been something for me to try to get anybody, anybody can see that and see, you'll never meet a determinist that lives like a determinist. <laughs> never. I've never met one. They, they just can't, they don't even interpret scripture consistent in that way. I mean, they go to, you know, uh, uh, Joshua 24, choose you this day whom you serve. And you read their books, read their commentaries. And this is one of the things that drew me out of that. I was reading the commentaries by Calvinists that I knew we didn't believe these things. And this is the way they wrote, because that's what the passage says. That's right. So the average person, that's where they can really go. If, if you can give them the, there's only two options on the uh, choice in, in the, uh, uh, in Christianity, there's three options, but nobody holds to the third one. It's these two. And so it's kind of a little hurdle getting them to understand these two. But then they can just look at any verse, any book, and see whether they believe God is giving a choice that has concomitant consequences or it's theater and he's just kind of you know, kidding around and they, they don't have a choice. Because, yeah. Are they, are they, are they acting out God's choices for them Yeah, or are they making choices? That's right. And, and they, they, the average person, you know, the first time you see free will in the Bible, as far as I know, is when God told Adam, name the animals. So it's not just in these theological discussions, it's right. everywhere. So right, okay, is Adam right. really naming the animals? Right, that's the or question. Or does God already <laughs> name the animals? And, and it's just coming through him like a pipe. And what's interesting, <laughs> uh, and in this book that I, this one's on prayer, is what it's the primary thing. But I, it's an interesting thing in the scripture, and these are not difficult passages either. So just like that one. So we normally think of there are these deterministic passages, you know, and. They're heavy. And then there's this free will passage. But the interesting thing to me is that there are some that it's mixed. That in this encounter between maybe two or three people or maybe groups of people, there are things that are clearly they're making choices unless you're importing your theology. They're clear. And then there are other things that are determined and they're happening in the same crucible of experience. So that Genesis God decided there would be a garden. He decided he'd put him in it. He decided there'd be a tree. This is where the tree is. And now I'm going to make animals. He, Adam had nothing to do with that. This is all determined by God. And then God said, name them. And it appears mm -hmm. everything, you have uh, determinism and some free choices happening simultaneously. And then you get into Genesis 3 and so forth. And this yeah. is what this is what I feel like I'm... I, just feel like I'm taking crazy pills on sometimes <laughs> is that that's, is what, that's for, what we do as Thomas. We make you do that. <laughs> it's just Thanks Erica, you know, spoonful, just like a <laughs> bowl and milk and just spoons full of crazy pills is uh, first of all, I think that we've, I wonder sometimes if we've seeded too much ground to the ought does not imply can hmm. I think, you know, in terms of choose this day, you should choose yeah. this day whom you will serve. Yeah. I think we've ceded a little bit too much ground to that in the libertarian circles. The other thing is that for determinism, for soft determinism, compatibilism to be false, I only have to demonstrate one libertarian free will choice. That's <laughs> one. That's one. <laughs> Never mind five, six, ten, you know, however many. Yeah. And... Uh, and I know that this is subjective, you know, but this is kind of a line. This is kind of my, one of my take it to the streets lines as well, is we all have consciences, God giving consciences, and we have the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us. That's, you know, telling, telling us off when we do the wrong things. So when we sin, we have a sense, whether it's from our conscience or the Holy Spirit that says, not, not just you should have done otherwise, but there's the sense of I could have done differently than that. I chose not to, and man, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, God, mm -hmm. please forgive me. 
Now, is that intuition? And I know, I know it's subjective. I know it's kind of experiential, but is your conscience lying to you? Because it's not the Holy Spirit lying to you, right. right? So we just have this deep intuition. So if that's true for that one instance where you slipped up and said, or maybe you just, mm-hmm. you wish you ordered a, a Big Mac instead of a quarter pounder. You're like, dang, mm-hmm. I, you know, this, this quarter yeah. pounder wasn't that great. I, I could order it. Is that true? Mm-hmm. If that's true, then libertarian free will is true. I, you know, crazy pills. I, I don't understand it. <laughs> well, I, I <laughs> maybe think I'm just Paul, too simple. Maybe I'm just too simple. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think the the conscience to me is, and you know, we don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to be dogmatic here, but it seems to me that it's moldable. And I think when you're rearing children, that's what mm. you're trying to do is develop their conscience. So if I told my child, we lived down the street from each other, and I reared my child that stealing over $10 was a sin, but if it was under 10, it wasn't. You told your child that stealing was wrong, period. Our children literally, when they're 20 years old, could go and my child could lift something for five bucks and have no guilt. So I think it's a moldable uh, thing, but, but regret itself is, is a libertarian activity that you regret that you should have done this and that (laughs) and because if it's all determined and that's what i say nobody lives like that they don't talk like that they don't read like that they don't they don't do anything like everything's determined once they leave the classroom or the lofty argument and i think we have conceded too much because here's the deal for me so uh so ought doesn't necessitate can all right so we, we have one situation, and that's what we're usually talking about. And, you know, well, you ought to do this, but that doesn't mean you can. And they give an example or two, and there are. So my question is this, well, what if that happens five times? What if it happens 10? In other words, you can't, I don't believe you can sustain that ought never hmm. bring the can in. Just because you can't. You don't have to have it here doesn't mean you don't have it here. And then also, and Leighton does a good job using a, a someone on a, I think it's a gambling thing because you can't pay, you can't do what you need to do to be saved on your own. And so be saved. We can't, but we're not saying God left us alone to do that. Right. We're saying he supplied everything and grace enabled to give us an actual opportunity to choose to believe or to walk away and whatever we did in fact choose we could have chosen otherwise by his grace so i think we've given too much too Mm. and i think it 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 the our calvinistic brothers and sisters are are very you know effective at you know like you said i think i think probably the go-to example is you know, the scriptures say, be perfect as your heavenly yeah. father is and perfect. Yeah. And guess what? You can't do that, but you ought to. Uh, yeah. Brother Layton has talked about that, that at length, the extent we can be perfect in the perfect one Christ That's right. after we trust in him and God places us to God places us in Christ. We don't place ourselves in, in him ourselves. Yeah. It's yeah. a, in fact, that's a, that's a Trinitarian interaction there mm-hmm. where, we are trusting in the son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit takes us and puts us into Christ yeah. for all of the, my Eric and I were just reminded of a, of an interaction that we had a while ago with someone just refusing to accept the fact that brother Layton misspoke when he said something like place ourselves in Christ and then, yeah. and then uh, clarified later on, but we all know how those yeah. inter- online interactions go so (laughs) yeah and you know we should they should think the best of us and we should think the best of them and when they uh on john piper i've interacted with him a lot interacting with him this book i think and the last book i interacted with him more than once but on one of them i came to believe that later he did not mean what i thought he meant I did this just kind of on my own. And a lot of people had already agreed that I was right. And and they agreed with this interpretation that I took from something that he wrote. And I think he was unclear. I don't think he did a good job. But I, it's not my habit 
to be ungenerous because we all mm. say gaffes. We all, I mean, you know, we just all do this. The more you talk, the more you've done it. Right. And so I actually wrote him a letter and apologized and showed him where I'd done this and what I did. And then I posted it on my blog and left it up for a week or two. So I made it public. And then I promised if it was ever reprinted, I would take it out. And so I did. And my point is uh, that that was on my part a fault. I jumped too quick and made took what he said and I should have thought about it. And he wouldn't really say that, even though I disagree with him, you know, vehemently. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we need to do. And they do that to Leighton. I've heard that several times and and Leighton sometimes just expresses things you know and and plus you're in the moment and plus he talks all he the does time. he does everything live I mean we're recording this uh, now we're gonna chop it up and put it together and make it look nice he does yeah. everything live and I'm jealous because that I means know. no editing it just goes out there and it's done and it's done and and if you you know you speak live very often uh, I had a guy correct me on something that I said to uh, Sunday night talking about angels. And I said, you're right. I mean, it just is what it is, you know, and you wish you could knew. Yeah. And that's the great thing about writing. You can look at it and go over it and over it and over it and over it. But Leighton, yeah, like you say, he just jumped right, right out there in the midst of them. Right. Yeah. So here at the Provisionist Perspective, uh, Eric and I are firmly convinced that sound doctrine is true and healthy doctrine for the church. It's, it's interesting lately, you know, within the past few months, I just learned that the word sound when we're talking about uh, sound doctrine means healthy doctrine. And I think that's a really interesting way of framing it and, and why it's important. But anyways, we could do a whole episode on that, <laughs> but that it, the healthy doctrine is important for the church. And it's something that we should get behind and promote and teach not just ourselves, obviously, first and foremost, but also others. So in light of this, what would be your encouragement or even challenge to, dare I say, normal, just kind of whosoever will Christians as they're in the space as far as promoting, uh, you know, a soteriology, theology that exalts God's glory as he is glorified in his love and provision for everyone? You're talking about in the milieu we're in where there's this Calvinism provision yeah, just, going on. How do they handle that, the average person? Is that what you're... Yeah, or well, what, what encouragement or challenge would you have in terms of this is something that we get behind? So I guess... <laughs> This, this question is really wordy. It could probably be used a little, a little bit of polishing. I think by the time I've gotten to the end of it, it's, it's like, what, what are you even asking? The, I think the heart behind this essentially is sound doctrine is just really important. Healthy doctrine is just really important. So what, what encouragement would you have to a normal everyday Christian person that's listening along? You know, they don't have a doctorate. They're not really pastoring right. anywhere. They're right. just trying to live their lives as far as, engaging with this in a way that is going to promote the health of the church, I guess, if that makes any sense. Well, first I would get in a healthy church and one that emphasizes uh, the exposition of scripture. And I mean, you know, just, just really emphasize that, not trying to impress people and so forth and so on, because I think, you know, you need to grow up as a Christian and that takes a well-balanced diet, and that's what you get in that. And then, you know, we just have so many tools. I have a guy, I do a three-year training of uh, certain men in the church, and one of them is dyslexic. So he's in my first year of this. It's a roundtable in theology. That's a lot of reading, and then they engage in all of this stuff, everything that a dyslexic person can't do. But because we have these tools he just records everything and he does it by that. So, so whatever their need is, I, I just encourage people. They'll say, well, I don't read much. Okay. Here's some podcasts. You know, you're, you're just, they need to utilize because there's never been a time in history that people had all that we have. And the second thing is that uh, on reading, you know, I try to encourage everybody, look, 
if you read two books in a year, you're going to read more than many. So you don't have to read it all one night, but you can read tweets or post and maybe get something. And then you can read an article. But some things it takes a book. And when we're not getting that as Christians, we are we are losing. Uh, I mean, I hate to use a big word, but in uh, uh, the epistemology, we're, we're losing the epistemological battle because only you, you, certain things you just can't cover well unless you have a book. And if you'll notice on the other side, and I'm not talking about within Christianity, I'm talking about even outside of it. I mean, the people who are making movies for us to go watch, they're reading all the time. So they don't want us reading, but they're reading. And so we have to utilize what God has given us as good stewards. So that's to be in a good church first and then find out the tools like the podcast and so forth. I mean, I just think the idea of a podcast is is so modern. I mean, nobody ever had this. And I mean, even True. when we had radios, you could listen to the radio, but now you can actually pick the podcast and you can listen to it anywhere you want, anytime you want. Yeah, it's amazing. So this, they, they've got to understand as just an average Christian, you have such opportunities to learn that you never did before. And so if they're in a good church, they can get some guidance with which uh, some of those are. And then one of the things we, we, we've dealt with college students a lot. And so I've had college students tell me, they say, well, I, I mean, I didn't understand everything that speaker said. Or, you know, I, yeah, I tried to read the book. I didn't understand everything. And I, so I say, so why do you want a book that you understand everything? Why, what, what is driving you to get a book that you're going to understand all of it? When you go to school and you're taking trigonometry mm -hmm. and you open it up, do you understand all of that? What about when you get through and you get past that test? Did you understand? No, but you know a lot more than mm. you did. And a lot of times are we're learning, but we're taking in new information. And now this is becoming more clear back here. And I tell him, I said, some of the most influential books I've had to read uh, because of a discipline I have. I said, sometimes I don't understand 25 or 50 percent of them. But boy, what I got out of it. I wouldn't have gotten unless I stayed with it. So I think some notions we have to get rid of. I think the notion, and here's another notion, they, you know, the preacher says, and unfortunately, he, he says, you know, well, I'm going to stop teaching until you, you know, apply all the other things that you've learned. And I'm not going to give you anything new. Well, that that's based on a false understanding of how knowledge and application works. We're not uh, 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 perpetual motion. We're not 100% efficient. So let's just say we're 10% efficient. We learn 100% of things in a message, but we only really walked away with 10% and maybe 5% is going to get in our life. But if you just stay there, you only got 5%. But if you keep giving them 100% every time, that percentage is going to go up. That's the way it really works. So I encourage them never to stop. And, and I use mm -hmm. myself because like I said, I read on a sixth grade level. I had to go back and when I started college and realized that they wouldn't let me take English, I had to take remedial classes. And so that I know for the smart people, they don't know, but that means you don't get credit. You just go. And, <laughs> but I had to go and my wife had a 12th grade English book, but I couldn't understand it. So I went mm. and bought uh, something like a second or third grade. I, I may have been, prideful and skipped a second grade and went to the third. And then I read that book and then I skipped a, maybe a grade and went to the fifth grade. And I just kept going until I learned it. And one day I took hers and was able to understand it. And then I read a college English book. My, my point is that that's what learning is. They College students do this every day in school. But yet when you come to the Bible, somehow they want this magical experience. A download. A download. Yeah, that's yeah. a good word, way to put it. It's it's interesting in these spaces, I've found that people think maybe my own obsession with this is reactionary because I feel like people don't care enough about these issues sometimes. Yeah. And many times they have an approach of, you know, yeah. don't know. It's just we don't understand it. It's mysterious. God is mysterious. There, there was a clip that I hope we can go over here one day that could be kind of like a shorter form content, Eric, I think I tagged you in it or, or maybe sent it to you, but it was Greg Laurie talking about predestination and free will. 
And it was just so I respect the brother. I've been to one of his, you know, big things and stuff. And I remember being quite moved just as a Christian and by the gospel message and stuff. But it was just very, very dismissive, not not very, you know, and, and I just was thinking, man, like he, he's been at this for a really long time to to not come very strongly, you know, in one direction or another on this yeah. issue. And uh, I, I won't speculate as to why that is, but that, yeah. but that is sort of like a clip or a snippet mm-hmm. of some of my own holy discontent <laughs> surrounding yeah. this issue. And it, you know, like you said, it's blood, sweat and tears, this learning stuff. And yeah. I don't have a formal education. I'm just a layman, yeah. you know, and I've not read as much as other people, but I've, yeah. I've read a fair bit. Sure. Um, so, uh, and you get, and you got to start somewhere. Like you said, so you do. And whatever you read, it helps. And then before long, you know, you've read uh, five books and there's some knowledge being synthesized in you. Hmm. And that's what people have to understand. And sometimes it's not it's not always how much you read, but is it what you got out of the book? And so some books I study, I don't read them. So Hmm. like when I have to work with this Hmm. Marxist, I have to study it. And because to read it doesn't help you much. But, you know, if you if you get more out of it and somebody else reads 20 books, but you got a lot out of this one book. So you can't I just don't think we can really weigh it like, you know, in my estimation, it's how it's what do you do with it? And do you get it in you? You know, how much of the book did you get in you? Sometimes people will say, Hmm. but see, I think you're in a good position to encourage people to read some because sometimes if they're a pastor they think well this is what you do which is true and but that's why i share where i came from because i want them to know that i did have a hard road this wasn't i wasn't you know i didn't just gravitate to books i didn't grow up with books nobody read a book in my home they read the newspaper i think but that was it we had Mm. no linear discussions Mm. so it's 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 not where you came from the guy who discipled me he didn't know that. And I and I, I started going to his church and he just he said, well, here's a good book. Read this. And I guess I didn't know I couldn't read either. And so I, I just knew it was really hard, <laughs> really slow and uh, try. But I, I'm thankful that he didn't, you know, cater to me and say, oh, well, if you can't read well, we won't do any of that. He just he just did it. And then we talked about it and. And I got a love for reading. So, hmm. cool. It's a cool little discipleship nugget there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dis- discipling and laboring. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you, Brother Ronnie. Uh, that I think that wraps it up for this interview. And we're thankful to have you on here. We really appreciate you jumping on and, and chatting with us. It's been it's been really good. And I feel like I've I've learned a lot and and been stimulated unto love and good works in, in the arena of just learning and applying ourselves to, mm-hmm. to knowing theology and theology. I mean, that's study of God. That's just knowing mm-hmm. God, yeah. you know, theology is such a scary word, I feel mm-hmm. like, and maybe we just need to call it knowing God, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. And I, again, I just so appreciate what you guys are doing and pray God's richest on you, but it is so much appreciated. And I think doing what you do and the time in which we live is immensely important to the work of the kingdom. And I appreciate it. And I'm thankful for having these few moments to get to know you and then also to talk with you. Hmm. Well, thank you so much. All right. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks.